Welcome to our second virtual reception here at the Britain Museum. I'm Ken Schuster, the Director and Chief Curator. And this evening, it's our pleasure to host a reception for Vanessa Compton, who's come all the way from Vermont. We feel like you know, she should have a standing ovation. So if you're there, you should stand up and stand up because it's incredible that this young lady drove all the way here, brought her art. And tonight, we're going to host her. And we don't have a glass of champagne for you. We will get you. So, Vanessa, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, um, I'm Vanessa Compton, and I just want to thank everyone for um, coming into this Zoom call, and especially to everyone here at the Bridge for opening up their museum, their homes, and their hearts to me. It has been such an honor to be here at this beautiful space located in Bighorn, Wyoming. Um, I am a collage artist, and this evening I'm going to be uh, walking around. Um, and thank you to Taishan for filming. And I will not be wearing a mask as we are going to stay um, at least six feet away from one another at all times. I have my trusty notes, um, and we'll be kind of talking about each of the eight pieces that I brought here this evening that were created over the course of eight years. Um, from 2012 to 2019. Um, and if you have any questions, um, hi to Kwasi, who already wrote in a comment. Um, feel free to add them and we'll try to address them at some point later. And then I'll be showing some of the work that I've been working on while I've been here on residency at the Vinton. So if you um, want to follow me, we'll come over to the first collage. <laughs> Um, and before I kind of dive in, I wanted to start off with a quote that I carry with me, and it's by the writer James Baldwin, and it's deeply inspiring to the way that I think about and approach my work, and it goes, American history is longer, larger, more various, more beautiful, and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it. My work is very much in response to this quote. I especially relate to the maximalist piece he's getting at when it comes to trying to understand this nation's history. I have been deeply moved by the work of Brian Stevenson, who's an American public interest lawyer who has dedicated his career to helping the poor, the incarcerated, and the condemned. Stephen has said that we are living in a post-genocide society, and I share this belief. I believe that the long and the bloody slaughter of indigenous people got us comfortable with and primed for hundreds of years of American slavery and an ideology of white supremacy that exists to this day. Uh, Stevenson has studied and written about how other countries have dealt with tragedy and has said, until we reckon with history, we are not going to be free. I really hold this close when it comes to making my work and I think about how in Rwanda, visitors to that country are urged to familiarize themselves with that nation's genocide. I think about how in Germany, a statues of Adolf Hitler are outlawed, yet um, the American South is littered with the iconography of the Confederacy. And America, in my estimation, uh, time and again, turns its gaze away from the strategic genocide inflicted upon the indigenous people of this country, which I believe the way paved, which I believe paved the way for everything after, and leads us up to where we are at this very moment. Um, for the past ten years, I have participated in artist residencies across the country, and um, these are places like Bighorn, Wyoming, that deeply inspire my work. They're places with wide, wide horizons, open skies, and um, they seem to be places where, upon looking at the landscape, you could blink, and it could be 100 years in the past. Blink again, it's a 1,000 years in the past, what that would look like. Maybe blink once more, and we're 100 years into the future. So my work is really kind of the past and the present and the future, um, hopefully layered upon one another. So the first piece that I brought, um, I completed it after coming back from my residency, the first time I went there, on the Navajo Nation, which was at the Hubble Trading Post National Historic Site. 
uh, located in Ganado, Arizona. There's elements of the past, so the Zeppelin in the far right corner, the settler couple sitting beneath the big wheel, perhaps in reflection of their lives. And then there's elements of the present, the nuclear cooling towers. And um, the part which has kind of kept my heart uh, for the whole time is the good luck image, which is taken from a, a rug woven by Melissa Cody, who I'm an extreme fangirl of, and she's a fourth generation Navajo artist um, and weaver. And she's able to definitely balance tradition and contemporary expression. So she's an amazing artist. Um, if you can, check her out, Melissa Cody. So now we can go to the second piece. Oh, this one, yes. <laughs> um, and this is called How the West Was Won. Um, and both these pieces are framed um, in barnboard, kind of aging between like 100 and 150 years old. Um, and I did that for a long time and kind of moved into a different direction around framing, but wanted to show kind of what I've done in the past. This piece was completed during my first artist residency um, in the uh, Western provinces of Canada. And I had never been there before. And I spent a month in 2012 in the East End, Saskatchewan, which is probably around the same size as Big Horn. Um, and it was a residency at the childhood home of the writer Wallace Spinner, who's been called the Dean of Western Writers. It was in this part of Saskatchewan that the great wide open Western landscapes began appearing in my work, and that still continued very much to this day. And it's where I began looking at the complex history and the myths of the cowboys and the indigenous people of these lands and started weaving these stories and histories into my work. And I especially got interested into the idea of great battles, ones that are complex, that are history, and there are perpetrators, and there are innocents, and there are those bearing witness. There's usually someone in each of the collages that is bearing witness. Um, and there are those in the rapture of violent action, and there is usually, as demonstrated here, also a lot of masculinity, which is a constant thread in my work. Um, so yeah, that's how the West was won. This is the oldest piece. Um, we'll now move to the newest piece, um, which is called A Night at the Garden. And in 2018, I went back to the Navajo Nation uh, to Hubble Trading Post National Historic Site to spend another month there on residency, and it also happened to coincide with the longest government shutdown in American history. And I'm really grateful to the people working there, especially Kathy, if she's watching, thank you, um, for making it possible for me to return um, there, even though the government shut down. So, um, like so many other tribes, the Navajo Nation was just um, one of many facing a shortage of food services, medical services, road services, and essential personnel as a result of the shutdown. And this piece was inspired very much by the moment in time. Uh, when I was there, there was a big lunar eclipse. It was called the Blood of the Wolf Moon. Um, and I really wanted to visualize a collection of world events that I felt were important to bear witness to. There are so many, but these were just some of them. I was thinking about where does collective pain go when there is no justice. Um, and want to talk about some of the images in here. So this image here, the background, this was a photograph that was taken in 1939 when 22,000 Americans rallied in New York's Madison Square Gardens to celebrate the rise of Nazism. So it's an event largely forgotten from US history. Um, there was a documentary that came out about it a few years ago, um, but when I think about you know all the amazing musical artists that perform there now, um, to think about uh, in 1939, what happened? And um, there was a Jewish protester who went on stage, um, kind of interrupted this 
event and was violently um, pushed off the stage. And that was all caught on film. Um, so over here in the bottom right, we have a young couple. Um, up here, we have Colin Kaepernick, who is the talented American football quarterback who in 2016 knelt for the national anthem before the start of the national football games um, as a protest against social injustice, especially the deaths of Black Americans and the of police. In doing so, he basically had his football career stripped from him uh, to this day. And he's only, I think, 32 years old. Um, the same organizations and leaders um, that didn't support his voice then now claim to support this moment very recently. So that is something I think about. Um, up here, this is a photo taken from a memorial that was created um, after at the Unite the Right rally that happened in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, when counter protester Heller Heyer vehicle and killed. So the way that I have been thinking um, has been that there are history collages and there are kind of my attempt to reflect on kind of this moment in time, being alive in the world, um, and the past, and kind of the push and pull between like what my identity means in this and the creation of the art. And that's been something that has been interest came up uh, back in high school I had a history professor who made us read the 1980 book by Howard Zinn uh, People's History of the U.S. Um, and this book tells America's history from the point of view and most importantly in the words of African Americans, Native Americans, women, the working poor and immigrant laborers you know, those, those whose voices have been silenced and largely omitted from most history books. This book has enduring insights into the development and destiny of our nation and deeply affected my teenage self. Um, and since then, there have been many books in the series to come out written by last year. A Navajo Nation is an it's written by Roxanne Dunmore Ortiz. Um, we'll move to the next collage, which was also completed at the same time. This is called Sacred and Profane. Um, this is more personal. It is set kind of in this landscape of the American Southwest, which is so beautiful. And as an outsider, I mean, you know, I'm from Vermont, but I am drawn to it like so many people have, where it's just sheer. Um, enduring beauty, the red rocks, um, you know, kind of the area of the four corners of America, where Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico meet, which also happens to be um, primarily where Navajo Nation is located, which is um, Virginia or in fact Ireland. By the COVID. And so uh, been thinking about these things. Um, this piece was really about uh, me thinking about masculinity. It was during um, like springing and um, thinking about the anger, like the parts about masculinity that I loved. Um, and I wanted to kind of balance that. I usually have like a push and Whole, of like light and dark and um, so the snake and snakes are featured predominantly in my work um, and this is um, inspired by a prophecy that I've heard which is Lakota and as manifested by the Dakota Access Pipeline and the pipelines that have been built across North America. So in this prophecy a black snake rises from the deep and bringing it bringing with it great sorrow and great destruction. Um, I was thinking about during this time, uh, by 
the prophecy of the sun. This foretells a time when you land and continue living on this beautiful earth together. So that's sacred and profane. Follow me. We'll go over to the next one. This one features something from Sheridan, Wyoming. Um, so this was created during my artist residency at Gentile Arts, which is an amazing artist um, residency program, which is located right down the road. And it's what brought me first to this beautiful part of the country. Um, for me, this is a piece about icons and what is real and, and what is myth, what is false, what is enduring. Um, so here we see the Wyo Theater sign, which is located on Sheridan's Main Street. It's iconic. Um, we see the muscle car, the campfire, the lonely smoke blowing up, the cabin. We see the couple on the ground here, and this was taken um, from a painting painted by a white artist, a white man. Um, and we see the image of this girl kind of looking out, bearing witness to it. And I think of her kind of in this moment of like cultural orphanhood, just kind of like the eternal foreigner, um, kind of bearing witness to this scene in front of her. So, I wanted to talk about another artist that deeply inspires me. His name is Kent Monkman. Um, and he is a Canadian First Nations artist of Cree ancestry and a member of the Fisher River Band situated in the Interlake region in Manitoba. Um, he's known for his provocative interventions into Western European and American art history. He's just an amazing, an amazing painter. And he explores themes of colonization, sexuality, loss, and resilience. And his work investigates the complexities of historic and contemporary indigenous experiences. And I highly recommend checking him out. Kent Longman. Um, we'll move next to this triptych. So this um, was completed while I was at Gentile. And it was um, my first triptych that I ever did. And I've gone on to do them. Um, a, it's practical when I'm doing artworks in these uh, faraway locations with shipping. If I do like a really big piece, it's a little tricky. If I do a triptych, um, they can go down into one nice box. Uh, but I also like the kind of spaciousness that it provides um, in thinking about these as like disparate pieces that are also um, one whole together. So I titled it The Doctrine of Discovery. And The Doctrine of Discovery, um, sorry if any of you already know about this, but it's a papal document that was issued 40 years before Columbus's voyage, which declared war against all non Christians throughout the world. And it specifically sanctioned and promoted the conquest, the colonization, and the exploitation of non Christians, um, those nations, and their territories. And there were a lot of those. Uh, this document is important to our nation because in 1823 it was privately adopted by the Supreme Court, and it asserted that Christian European nations had assumed ultimate dominion over the lands of America during the age of discovery, and that upon this discovery, quote unquote, Native Americans had lost their rights to complete sovereignty as independent nations and only retained a right of occupancy in their lands. So in other words, these indigenous nations were subject to the ultimate authority of the first nation of Christendom to claim possession of a given region of their lands. Um, and if I am correct, uh, this doctrine of discovery was uh, formally rejected um, at the Standing Rock protest uh, by clergy who had come to stand in uh, solidarity um, there. So it's a fascinating piece of history. This is a very, you can see some of my pieces were more kind of busy, the next one we'll go to, but this is more spacious where it's primarily um, acrylic. 
and then the pieces are collaged in, um, but there is a sparseness to it. Um, which uh, the other next piece that we'll go to is quite the opposite. It is um, almost kaleidoscopic in nature. Um, and this is a piece that I created during my first time on the Navajo Nation. It's called Science Plateau, which is um, an area located um, right next to where I was staying. Um, and I completed this while in residency there. And um, Hubble Trading Post is the longest uh, continuously run trading post in the American Southwest. Um, it is the epicenter of Navajo weaving. I mean, there are just so many beautiful rocks and incredible artists um, whose work has been um, on exhibit there, traded there, and bought there. Um, and Navajo rocks are just so, so beautiful and take a long time to make. Um, I have a lot of respect for that medium. Um, this piece really demonstrates my style where past, present, and future exist simultaneously. Um, and although I was formerly trained as a sculptor, I love collage and I really feel it's like a feral, almost outsider medium and it allows me to communicate exactly the way that I want to um, and images will quilt their way in and I use a combination of acrylic, oil, uh, scissors obviously in that medium to create these pieces. Um, as an artist, I, I try to surround myself with voices of those um, not currently benefiting from the system. Um, and when I talk about the system, I think about um, this quote by Adrienne J. Keen, who is an academic, a writer, and an activist. And she's a member of the Cherokee Nation. And she writes, the system in what is currently known as the US is broken. It was designed by male white supremacist slave owners on stolen indigenous land to protect their interests. It's working as designed. Um, so I have found deep inspiration in artists who kind of challenge um, some of the uh, things that I think about and see in the news and kind of in the culture around me. I, I found deep inspiration in the work of the Chinese dissident artist, Ai Weiwei. Um, like him, my work is very political, which I have been comfortable with and uncomfortable with at different times. Um, it's in response to contemporary issues around social justice, sovereignty, and challenging issues of power and privilege. I'm interested in systems of oppression and where they interlock, where they interconnect and intersect. I'm interested in understanding the roles that settler colonialism played in forming our national identity. And my hope is that in creating work, it's a voice among many, many, many um, in a mass movement towards positive social change and justice. Um, we'll go to one more piece, and this is the smallest one. Uh, it's called Remains of the Day. And um, the remains um, of September 11th are here. Um, huge loss of American life. Um, and I believe that the pandemic numbers have now like overtaken those, but um, I think everyone can remember where they were on that day. We have the kind of American frontier town. Um, which has an enduring beauty to me as an artist, as like a foreigner looking in. Um, this piece is also the first time I used an image of myself with my mother, hi mom. Um, and uh, it's something that I'm continuing now to do more and more. Um, it's also where I started using spray paint, which is a new media that I've been using recently as well. Um, so in thinking about collage, um, and thinking about the kind of work I want to do, um, I think about representation and how much it matters. And that's been something I've been trying to learn about as an artist and person in the world, as there is overwhelming evidence of young people being negatively affected by negative or limited representation. You know, images matter. Um, who gets to tell whose story? Um, I think about these things when it comes to selecting which images to use because 
as a white cisgendered woman, I have benefited from my country's systems of oppression. I'm right near the top of the pyramid of power. And I constantly am asking myself, am I participating in the same ideologies I wish to criticize? How do I deal with grief uh, when it comes to learning about history and making this work? Is my work Western? Is it revisionist Western? Is it post-Western? Is it anti-Western? Um, answers to these questions change each time I, I sit down to make work. Uh, what remains constant and what I believe to be true is that in accountability lies a possibility for positive change. And I am deeply anti-racist and moving the needle and surely making mistakes along the way and trying to learn from them. So that's all I have for now. And um, if you want to follow me, I can show you some of the new work that I've been working on. Okay. We're in the beautiful Northern Trust Gallery at the Brinton Museum. And everyone should drive to Wyoming and come visit this gorgeous museum. And real quick, uh, we had some comments at the beginning. I didn't get a chance to oh, okay. uh, say them. Uh, one is from William Davenport. Uh, <laughs> and again, okay, uh, you probably know what he's saying. Um, Dor Dorkinar, I hope I didn't butcher that. Uh, love, husband, and Liam. Uh, oh, my and, Thank, and, you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, guys. And he also comes. That was Thank a, you, Tyson. Sorry. A curatorial assistant and has the walking around and filming. Um, here, uh, I have also been on residence for two weeks and I'm kind of coming up on and across the country. The, the second night, uh, 100 miles outside, when the kind of first were um, starting, needless to say, I've been to listen and watch new different sources. I'm not sure, I, I try to kind of try to educate and re-educate myself over and over again, and the world moves so fast. Um, so I wanted to do a piece kind of in reaction, or a few pieces. Um, so the first piece that I did when I arrived here is um, an image, let me hold this up. Um, this is a protester who was at the Unite the Right rally that I was speaking about before, where a counter-protester, Heather Heyer, was killed. Um, and this is an image that I've had for a few years since then. And it has been kind of deeply uncomfortable, just not knowing what to do with this man, basically. Um, I have used the image of like the halo, which shows up a lot in like religious artwork in my, I've used it in my work. Um, and I had a studio visit once from a painting uh, professor, an artist who kind of challenged me to do work that um, instead of the viewer kind of knowing where I stand and where my leanings are kind of socially and politically, that would force them to kind of maybe question it or it wouldn't be necessarily didactic to them. So I uh, had this image blown up, put it on there, um, and then it's, all of this work is still in progress, but I then um, found these images from the graduating class um, in 2001 um, from the country's most diverse high school. This is the senior class there, and it was in Virginia. And so these are students from all over the world, like internationally, um, uh, just a huge population of countries represented. And so I kind of wanted to like represent kind of the enduring hope that the youth have um, when it comes to the world that we're living in and, and the world that they're going to inherit from us. Um, so that's kind of another like light and dark kind of push and pull of the energies when it comes to the work. So still in progress. 
And then wanting to do another triptych while I'm here, kind of out in this beautiful, wide landscape. And so I have this triptych here, um, and it's set kind of in what is like a, meant to be kind of a Wyoming landscape. Um, and it originally was going to be another battle, and I was going to have kind of this like violent action going on, and it has it's it's softened and very much in progress, but wanting to represent you know, the wide open skies of this landscape, um, but also this moment. So um, there are historical images in here, and there's images that were taken like literally last week. Um, so images from the protests that have been happening nationally and then internationally. So um, we have a woman here who's holding up a Black Lives Matter uh, sign kind of in between this black man and this white man. Uh, contemporary image up here of a young father holding his daughter, bearing witness. Um, past images would be this photograph uh, by the amazing photographer Di Diane Arbus, um, who I'm sure many of you have heard about. Um, so I'm still working on it, but um, I, feel like there is so much going on in the world that um, I do identify with, you know, many, many artists have said, um, and Nina Simone has said, you know, that it's kind of our responsibility as artists to reflect on the times um, and trying to do that. So the way that I work, if that's of interest, um, scissors, obviously, paintbrush, Matte medium, which is basically just like a fancy archival glue, and then images. So I brought along, I have these like gallon bags, and I probably have about a hundred of these at home. <laughs> um, and then when I'm working, they're just spread out so I can like create like a carpet of images. And they're all organized kind of thematically. So, you know, in this one I have children. And this one, I have the feminine. This one is like very, very full. So is the masculine. So I need to make kind of more uh, definitive subjects for these. Um, the people gathering clouds, which you know I've needed to use a lot with this piece. Um, eyes, which I figured predominantly in my work. Um, I have colors, you know, kind of anything you can think of, and I'm always adding new. Uh, themes to the way that I organize, but organization is very important. So if I'm going to do a piece on, you know, femininity, I know that I can access the images that I already have and um, kind of go from there. So, and I'm also doing a piece um, that's very specifically about this area and features an image of the Brinton in it. So no one's seen it yet, but <laughs> we'll show you photos when it's done. Um, so that's it on my end, and um, I think Danica, you want to? This is Danica. She's going to ask me. Some I am Danica Chow. I am the Cato intern in Brenton this summer, and I appreciate the Cato panel for uh, allowing this to happen. It was a really great experience to be able to intern here as an artist myself. I'm a student at Sheridan College getting an arts administration certificate, which is another awesome opportunity in a rural, rural area. So um, you are visiting from Vermont, right or from the original? I raised, yeah, we moved around a lot when I was a kid. Um, my dad's from Massachusetts, my mom's from Quebec, so Vermont's kind of in the middle, but that's the place that I think of home is Vermont, and um, I just recently got married and moved to Burlington, which is kind of our big city, which looks kind of like a small village in comparison to most places, but it's been nice. Or go to the art store and not have to plan, right? Yeah, <laughs> things like that. Okay. Um, so are you, what is your education on that? Um, so I got my Bachelor of Fine Arts at um, CU Boulder, and my emphasis there was in ceramic sculpture, and I loved it. Sculpture is, uh, like ceramics can do so much with it. Um, the one thing is that it's very kind of of a place. It's hard 
And at that time, kind of after graduating, um, I was working as a lot planning guide and going west every winter, and it wasn't possible to maintain practice with that medium. Mm -hmm. And so I transitioned to collage. Um, and my grandmother was a professional artist and worked in collage also. So my style is very different from hers, but it kind of was like a coming back to a uh, moment for me. Uh, and so that was probably about 13 years ago. So, but I've always, always been art, you know, always been doing art and I'm very grateful that my parents were supported that um, kind of from when I was a little kid. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a question I've noticed yeah. that a lot of artists come to this. It seems that art comes to creatives from families. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now that I know you for, from what went to school in Boulder, I see that inspiration in your artwork. With really? The, with the flat irons and I think your layering oh, of yeah. shapes. And I never thought about it. Yeah. Thank um, you. <laughs> Uh, real quick, can we just back up? So yeah. Vanessa uh, has some light. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's perfect. All right. Um, and also, I got a couple chat uh, questions. Um, one is from Cletus Wilcox. Uh, how often does your work change meaning mid-process? Hi, Cletus. Cletus is a really talented collage artist and friend of mine. Um, mid-process. So, like... This past week, like I was going to do a triptych that was a battle. I was, you know, I, I was thinking about um, Battle of Little Bighorn, um, is it Dull Knife? Dull Knife. Huh? Dull Knife. Like this area has so much history. And then I start off and I had all these kind of violent images, you know, people kind of like in action. Um, and I just, I, I, I softened and kind of was like feeling a lot of grief. And so that has shifted. I will often, um, you know, kind of like know the, the piece. The and like personally, um, but more often what it is kind of happening in the world that I'm listening to. Thank you. And I had another chat. Um, this is from George Middleton. Uh, really excellent, Vanessa. What you said is deeply moving and inspirational. I feel so grateful to know you as a colleague and friend because hearing your thoughts about the work always energizes my own thinking, not only about the work, but also about the role of the artist and what we can do to support the transformation. Thank you, George. Well, that is so very sweet. And George is an artist who I've collaborated with which has been a really fun kind of recent thing. Um, he is a firefighter, uh, I think recently retired. Congratulations, George. And also an incredible watercolorist um, working out of Lowell, Mass. And um, for a few times, he's driven up north and we've struck up this artistic friendship and we'll do pieces together where, for example, because he's so skilled um, at these beautiful landscapes created in watercolor, He'll paint this landscape, and then I'll collage in um, the people, the things that exist within it. So George has taught me a lot about kind of how I approach my work, and I look forward to continuing collaboration with him. Uh, Danica, do you have any more questions? Um, your color usage struck me as it's so vibrant, especially when you're the collage pieces tend to be sort of monochromatic. Yeah. Um, maybe just talk about your color usage because it's so, those colors are rich and bright and yeah, and living in this space where, um, especially with your political um, view and I don't know. I, yeah, definitely. I love color, <laughs> unabashedly. Um, and I think it's not um, something that I really think about kind of intellectually, it's more instinctual. I do love beauty. Like I want pieces to be like, if you're just gonna walk by really quickly, that you would just kind of say, oh, that's like beautiful. Or, you know, that's like a beautiful um, uh, palette that I'm looking upon. Um, 
And then it's only upon like closer inspection that you'll see that, you know, maybe the first, the beauty that you see from afar, the beauty of the red rock, you know, the, the, the clouds and the skies um, are kind of like holding this tension that exists upon closer introspection. Beauty is kind of the like, the comfort, the like the sweetness of, you know, living in the world. It's, it's, it's a privilege to be able to look out upon a beautiful landscape like I've been doing while I've been here on residency. Mm -hmm. um, and it is something that I've also, like left, left alone to my own devices, my pieces would be so busy and so colorful. And I'll try to kind of say, you know, like this, when I think about this piece, this is more kind of like, you know, gray, like this took a lot of restraint, even though it's very busy. Um, and in my, my most recent work, trying to pick like one color that I'm really focusing on and trying to omit the rest. And it's like a huge challenge for me. And I think that's before you embark on a on a new piece of work. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I tried to bring different examples where some were a little bit sparser and some were really busy. Um, but I love color. Okay. How do you um, feel these are re relate to your as a sculptor? So, different? Were you? No, I mean, oh, I did this series called the Private Moment Series. And it would be, um, if you look at them like while you're walking by, you know, kind of fast, it's the same thing. You'd say, oh, isn't that cute? You know, it's just like uh, people doing something cute. And then upon closer interest, introspection, um, you would realize that, you know, these pieces were miniature, you know, maybe like six by six by six in brown stoneware. You'd realize that it's like this image that I've, I've created is someone like on their deathbed and there's someone kind of, tenderly like putting their arm around them or um, uh, in the first moments of life, like a father and a newborn. Um, and I would kind of see it as a success when people would just like breeze by. I, was, I would watch people who come see the work. They say, oh, everything's so cute, you know, and it's literally like these moments, uh, you know, family, like private moments um, that we all experience and that connect us, like, despite whatever our political affiliations are, we all experience humanity. life and death and humanity. Um, the humanity, I think that's like, I really believe um, that we all are in relation to one another, no matter where we are. Um, and I believe that transformation is possible. Like I am an optimist and I think about, you know, um, what happened in the late 60s, paving the way for where we are now. Um, so many like opportunities to, to have history teach us. Um, and I do believe that um, change and transformation of society and the world is possible. Um, and it is also like, there is so much to be a grief about like every single day. Um, and so I think about, you know, the work of teachers who have to get up and especially in this time of pandemic, like adjust what they're doing for the next generation. And there's so many be inspired by. The person who's watching right now is uh, Kwasi Mpene. Hi, Kwasi, who is um, watching from Michigan. He was my ethnomusicology professor. Um, at Sea Boulder, and he's originally from Ghana, and he has that fire in him with his students that even though it's been uh, 15 years now since I graduated, um, and he's teaching in Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, I know that he's like carrying that fire to the next generation of his students, and people like that, with kind of apathy, I feel it rising up, and, and depression at the state of the world, um, to be able to turn to other people who um, can kind of hold us up during that time. So very grateful to you, Kwasi. Um, so where do you see your work going from here? We talked a little bit about your evolution, but from here on out, yeah, I think what you're doing is transforming. I think um, that 
uh, noticing like what makes me uncomfortable is a good kind of compass for that. And so that has been using images of myself. I've been like really in the past and like with these works trying to bear witness and, and at times thinking that I'm bearing witness neutrally. But um, as I've been kind of thinking about um, the, the places where I sit um, kind of in uh, the power structure of the U.S. and the world um, and the often ease that I'm afforded because of um, who I am as a white cisgendered woman, um, that, that there, like neutrality is impossible. Um, and so that by kind of starting to use images of myself, which I have done this past winter, deeply uncomfortable, and um, also, I think, deeply important so that um, there is kind of this intimacy um, and engagement with the work that I'm creating and in this new way. So um, having the work be more personal, um, at least for the time being, that's like what I'm thinking of for the next you know, few years. So we'll see where that goes. Yeah. <laughs> No, no. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Thank we sure you. enjoyed our time with you. I truly appreciate it. And thank you everyone for joining the first, my first virtual today. It's actually really nice because there's no small banter and you can just kind of <laughs> talk about your work. So I appreciate everyone for tuning in and thank you to everyone here. I really appreciate being the host and um having such a beautiful museum for this community and for our visitors. So thank you. Thank you for making the trip. Yes, thank <laughs> you. Good night, folks.